Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Chris Enroth. I am a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension. And today, we are going to be talking about a very exciting topic. Well, like, exciting if you're really into chemistry, I suppose. Uh, we're gonna be talking about pesticides. And, you know, when it comes to gardening, gardening is a beautiful process. Uh, uh, we are able to create uh, pictures of, of color and just absolutely romantic uh, pops of beauty in the world. Uh, it's fun to do with people, with our friends. Uh, you can see here a group of our McDonough County Master Gardeners after a hard morning's work. And the thing about gardening, though, you know, we can grow fresh produce, but oh, ooh, what is that? at the base of the plant. Ooh, that looks like some type of an insecticide. Uh, nobody look, please, uh, everybody, avert your eyes. Because it seems even though gardening, we work to reconnect with nature, there are some confrontational or uh, we would call them contentious issues with some of the things that we do in the garden. Not everybody can agree on the exact same thing. And that's when we dive into pesticides. And one of the biggest questions that our extension office seems to get, or you know, when we're talking about uh, having to control some type of pest, is folks will ask, are organic pesticides safer? And so that's why I put together this, this program today to try to address that question and see if maybe we can shed some light on, on this issue for, for folks. And the idea with Extension is that we deliver research-based information. Uh, we give you this knowledge so that you can make more informed decisions. And um, so if you do have questions though throughout the session, please, you can type those into the chat box. My contact information will be up there at the end of the presentation, so feel free to check it out. And the other thing I'll add is there's there's not as many pretty pictures with this presentation because when you're talking pesticides, well, the pictures are very pretty. Uh, so so please bear with me on this, but we're going to go through uh, quite a bit of information. But this is it's hopefully to help you when you're staring at that massive aisle of pesticides in the garden center and, and helping you to decide what to do next. So are pest, organic pesticides safer? Again, a major question. Well, the answer is not really that clear cut. The thing is you can look at lots of different scientific studies that are examining pesticides and these will typically look at the toxicity of this pesticide to various animals they're also going to study the mode of action and the mode of action is the thing that actually does the killing of the pesticide and in what way that does it so for instance there is a pesticide uh, no the product name is tenacity and the active ingredient in that is mesotrione Mesotrione works by blocking the production of, uh, of photosynthesis. It doesn't allow the pigments to develop in the leaf, so the plant can't photosynthesize, it can't feed itself, and it starves. So that would be like a mode of action. And then we also have epidemiological studies, and these are uh, researches that they follow humans over the course of time that have been exposed to certain pesticides. And you can look at all these different types of, of studies and you can come to this conclusion that everyone has an opinion, obviously. And in this case, it's the opinion for or against the use of synthetic pesticides. I would just say uh, right off the bat, if you're looking for that answer of is organic safer, it's important to be cautious of blanket statements because it really turns out just because it's from nature does not mean that it's safe or that's inherently good or evil. You just have to be able to evaluate your situations on a case-by-case -case basis. So you're gonna separate your gardening or your landscaping practices. You're gonna look at each one individually and what pests you wanna control. And you're gonna to have to, to examine those on a case-by-case -case basis. So we're gonna, that's pretty much what we're covering today. But we can't talk about organics without looking at its history and where the organic, the idea of organic practices really came from. So in, in terms of its history, you know, we also have to define some terms here. 
So if we look at the term organic, chemically speaking, this is used to describe any molecule that contains carbon, carbon-based life. That would be considered an organic molecule. So if you look about how they divide chemistry, organic chemistry versus inorganic chemistry, carbon is a major player right there. If we look at another way that we define organic, um, it by itself it really means very little, but again, companies can market a product as organic because it is uh, organic based. It contains that carbon molecule. Then we have the term certified organic. This means the product was certified by a third party organization. There's a couple different third uh, organizations out there that do have the certified organic stamp and they all have their own set of criteria. So in essence, there's no real standard here. When we look at organic, the really the term that holds the most weight is the one that comes from the federal government, and that is USDA certified organic. That means that there are specific definitions about what may be used to produce this product or what has gone into producing this product. And just as a, an addition here, the word natural aside from the definition in the Webster dictionary has real no definition in terms of marketing a product. Companies can use this any way they want. If we examine where organic came from, it really wasn't a trend way back in the, the day. It was about survival because we didn't have a lot of our modern conveniences or modern chemistries that we use today. If we look back uh, in terms of some of the, the way plants were grown historically, let's look at Sir Albert Howard. He's really considered kind of this founding uh, member, uh, person of the organic, the idea of organic um, early on kind of 1900s. He was an advisor uh, from, from the UK to India, and he noticed that when he was in India, Crops were losing vigor year after year because the British Empire, they were going to India and they were applying their methods of growing crops to this new and different environment. And they noticed that year after year they were losing yield. Everything was going down. And so then he, he studied, he traveled a couple different cultures, um, and he was really interested in these cultures were able to sustain yields over long periods of time. And he found out that the Chinese were able to sustain this crop yield year after year, despite farming the same ground for centuries. And when he examined the differences in these systems, what he found is that the Chinese, they were adding organic matter, which is carbon-based material, back to the soil every year. And they were doing this in the form of manures and compost. And based upon his observations, he published an agricultural testament in 1940. And this is kind of considered the, the, the core or kind of the, the ball that got the organic movement rolling. So if you notice something, though, there's no, there's no talk about pesticides here. This is about soil. You'll see this continues. So Lady Eva Balfour, she took uh, that research and she, uh, she kept it going and she uh, also d was doing research back in uh, the UK, and then she published something similar. She called it the living soil in 1943. Again, it was based upon soil management as the organic practice. And then this name you might recognize, Jerome Cohen, or J.I. Rodale. Uh, he founded Rodale Press and the Rodale Institute, and he used this publishing house to get his message out to the masses. But again, is the message was primarily on organic management of soils. Again, not too much on pesticides until things changed in 1962 when Rachel Carson published her book, Silent Spring. I think a lot of us have probably read that. If not, highly recommend it. Um, this book pretty much pioneered and forced the world to take a look at the use of pesticides. After reading this, this became a barrier to a lot of folks using synthetic pesticides back then and even today. And it changed the perception of pesticides so much that it forced the U.S. government to look into the effects of pesticides on humans and the environment. So up until this point, you know, the idea of being organic was about soil management, but it's when 
we Silent Spring came out um, onto the bookshelves and suddenly we started looking more critically at our pesticide use and the idea of uh, organic synthetic pesticides, that idea, that spark was lit right there. So what about pesticides? Well, I guess there's some things that we need to talk about with pesticides. First of all, what are they? So a pesticide, this is an umbrella term. Now, a lot of folks, they'll say like, oh, an insecticide, that's uh, something you might use, or an, an herbicide, or a fungicide. Well, yeah, those are all types of pesticide. A pesticide is any product that has been designed to destroy, prevent, or repel any li living thing that has been deemed as a pest. So basically, these are products designed to kill. And that's just something that we want to keep in mind that when we are dealing with a pesticide, we are dealing with something that was made to destroy another living thing, whether it's organic or synthetic. They're, they're all, the, the end action, the, the thing that we want to get out of these is all the same thing. And on each pesticide, there is a label, and the label is considered federal law. Extension at programs, at every extension program, you know, I teach, I always work this in here, you know, if you're using a pesticide, make sure to read the label. Because so few people tend to do that, but we really need to make sure that we're reading these labels and following them to the letter. The label is going to tell you what's in that container, the safest way to handle it, what pests and plants these products can be used on, and the most effective rates for control. You know, a lot of us say, well, a little's good, a lot must be better. That's not true, and it could either be a waste of time or damaging to you or the environment to use too much pesticides. So the label is the law. Make sure you follow that label. When you're reading that label, in terms of danger to humans, there are these things called signal words. It's a way for us to quickly reference the acute toxicity to humans. And now acute toxicity, this refers to say, I accidentally spill some of this product on my skin. Or maybe I inhale some of this product, or hopefully not, but ingest this product. It tells you what is the immediate danger, the acute toxicity. So caution, this means it's the least toxic. Warning, it's kind of that middle ground, it's mildly toxic. Danger, or also it could also be noted as danger poison. This is the most toxic. It's usually accompanied with a skull and crossbones icon. Truthfully, you should not have any situation in the home garden that would warrant the use of a danger uh, a signal word pesticide. So hopefully you don't have any of this on your, your shelf in your garage or wherever you keep your pesticides. Really should be avoiding these types of products. Now, now also let me call to mind again, this is acute toxicity. This is not chronic exposure. So something to, to also keep in mind the type of pesticide. We have really two basic types. We have RTU or ready to use, and then we have concentrated products. Concentrated products are those that have to be mixed in say a, a pump, uh, a spray can or something. So in terms of relative risk and safety, RTU are, are already diluted. They are at a low concentration. The concentrated form of pesticides pose the highest hazard to homeowners, farmers, whoever's using it, whoever's mixing that product, because it is its most concentrated form right there. And you have to mix it in, in water or some type of a solution to dilute it to then be sprayed on whatever thing it is you're trying to control. So in terms of relative risk, concentrated products, these have the highest amount of risk. They pose the highest hazard to us. So what do we do about uh, pesticides and trying to rank their 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 risk over time? Uh, you know, because those signal words they only look at the acute toxicity. Well, there is this one method. It's that 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 you can use to help you in uh, examining the risk of a pesticide. It's called the EIQ or the Environmental Impact Quotient. Now, the EIQ 
consists of three parts. One is risk to the applicator, risk to the consumer, and risk to the environment. And so uh, scientists, they will take studies on these three different parts and they will then categorize them, they will score them, and then each one gets averaged to come up with the EIQ number. So the higher the EIQ, you know, 100, that would be a very high EIQ, that means there are greater chances for negative impact to people and the environment. Low EIQ, you know, the low would be considered around 10, means there's a fairly low chance for a negative impact. So high number is bad, low number is better. Something to keep in mind with EIQ, this stuff is not set in stone. As new research and new science comes out about a particular pesticide or product, these numbers do change over time. The other thing to keep in mind is that they are not perfect. There are some pesticides that have some pretty negative consequences that are not necessarily reflected in that EIQ number. And we'll be going through different pesticides today and I will point that out. And this is also typically not listed on pesticide labels, so where can you find them? A really good resource is you can go to uh, your favorite internet search engine, type in EIQ Cornell. Cornell University has a great uh, spreadsheet that you can download that lists every single uh, registered pesticide and its EIQ number. So when you are going to select a pesticide, and you want to select one that's lowest risk, you can use the spreadsheet to help you organize these different pesticides and pick out some of the lower EIQ numbers. And we are going to be using EIQ when discussing the risk associated with pesticides. So let's start with our first family of pesticides. These are herbicides. And we're going to start with the organic stuff first. Corn gluten meal. Probably you've heard of corn gluten meal. Uh, it has come on the market in the last couple decades as a, a great pre-emergent that you can use on your lawns. And it's a byproduct of the corn milling process. And it's often touted as being very safe. So safe, it's used in cat food. So does that mean you should be eating this stuff? No, don't eat it. It's not meant for you to eat it. It's meant to be spread on a lawn. These act as a pre-emergent, and there is also a fair amount of nitrogen in it, about 10% nitrogen. So it's a great product for lawns. Now, something to keep in mind when I say very safe. I want you from now on to stop thinking about pesticides in terms of safety. I would rather you think about them in terms of levels of risk. That is a more accurate way to examine a product. Because if we look at a table saw, Table saws have items on it that make them safer, you would say. So they have a safety guard. This guard prevents kickback, so you're feeding a piece of lumber into the table saw. This, this covering on the top of the, the blade prevents kickback of that piece of wood kicking back and hitting you or, or, and, or hitting you in the face. So when you put that guard on and then you tell the user of that saw, oh, it's safe now they tend to use it more with reckless abandon. So I always like to think about things in levels of risk. So if you say, okay, put the guard on, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't call it safe, but your risk has been lowered because you have made steps to reduce the amount of risk. So maybe the user of that table saw realizes, okay, I still have to be cautious. I still have to treat this tool with respect. And that's what pesticides are. They are tools that we have to make sure that we treat with good amount of respect. Okay gotten that out of the way. Some of the drawbacks to corn gluten meal. According to the label, you have to apply 20 pounds per thousand square foot to get those pre-emergent effects, and that is a lot. That's up to two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square foot, which is double the amount that extension typically recommends for a lawn. And the other way that it works is it acts as a desiccant to germinating weed seed, which means it dries it out. As the weed seed germinates, it dries it out. If your soil moisture is high, your corn gluten meal is not going to work very well. And also, if we think about the cost of this product, there are synthetic chemicals that can offer better weed control at a far better price. Then we look at something like flame weeding. Oh, this is fun. I got my own flame weeder. It's a lot of fun. It's basically a blowtorch. Um, 
it's really good at uh, hitting those weeds in terms of a post-emergence. One drawback is I'm strapping a propane tank to my back and I could explode. That's a pretty acute level of toxicity or danger, I guess you would call it. Um, the other thing is it only kills the tops of plants, not the roots. So it's good for control of annuals, but not necessarily perennial weeds. And fire is dangerous. If you do this on a mulch bed, it will smolder. And unbeknownst to you, it could flame up hours later. So you definitely don't want to be using this during dry conditions. And you can easily kill desirable plants, and I will add other living things too. So the, 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 there is a, a higher level of risk associated with flame weeding. And then there's hand weeding. It's good exercise. It's also a good time. You have your, your face in your vegetables or in your landscape plants, so it's a good time to see some pests. It just helps things taste better when you've sweat for them. And there are also tools out there to help you cultivate and get rid of those weeds. However, the drawback is it takes time and it may not be practical depending on your size of the yard. But this is an organic way to address weeds. Mulch is another organic way. It smothers weeds. It holds the soil in place and insulates it. It will decompose and provide organic matter and a smattering of soil nutrients. Some drawbacks though is that more mulch doesn't always mean a good place for plants to grow. And you can over mulch and suffocate plant roots. Things that I usually see is folks will typically just dump new mulch on top of old mulch which creates layers and barriers to air and water to get to the soil. It can also harbor insects and disease and if you till that into the soil um, it can tie up nitrogen. Uh, if you just top dress it can tie up soil nitrogen but really not in a way that will impact plants. It really just t ties up nitrogen in that top layer of soil. Another organic option, salt. This is something that's been used by humans for hundreds of years and it's safe. We put it on everything from our fries to our soil. One of the drawbacks is though the the use for it was typically in wartime where the armies would go in and kill off enemy crops by salting their fields. There are few plants that are resistant to salt and one of the extension recommendations way back when was to salt your asparagus patch because it would kill the weeds. Asparagus are incredibly deep rooted plants and they could tolerate that. However, you do increase uh, the, the saltiness of your soil and salt is soluble in water and it can move and kill nearby plants. It also kills soil organisms. So, you know, let's keep them on the fries and probably leave them off of the soil. And we get into some other products that you might see uh, stacked up on the garden center shelf. This is acetic acid or a vinegar. This is similar to flame weeding, so it's a good knockdown of top growth. It acts very quickly. Some of the drawbacks though is that it's highly caustic. If you get this in your eye, it can blind you. These are a high, are very, very acidic uh, products. So proper PPE or personal protective equipment is essential. And it kills more than just plants. If you get in on amphibians, beneficial insects, they will also die if they're sprayed with this vinegar. Similar to flame weeding, perennial plants can regrow from their root system. So again, if we look at risk here, highly caustic, and can affect um, wildlife and aquatic organisms. There is a higher level of risk here, even though this is often touted as an organic remedy to weeds. Now let's change gears and look at some of the synthetic herbicides. If we look at broad spectrum herbicides, and, and these are herbicides that they don't kill what they touch, they kill it. Um, so we have glyphosate. That is one we're going to spotlight here in just a second. But it has an EIQ of 15.3. Compare that with gluf glufosinate ammonium, 28.2, or diquat, 31.7. I like to stick with EIQs, if I can, if at all possible, that are 20 or below. Um, that's just my comfort level. Maybe yours is different. So, but these are broad spectrum herbicides that we use. So let's look at glyphosate because, you know, this is uh, 
what's in the news quite a bit. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. In terms of impact on humans, uh, we are seeing the evidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and this is based upon a 1999 study that showed those exposed to glyphosate had a 2.3 times greater chance of developing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, so let's look at this 1999 study. There's been a lot of research on glyphosate. If we pull out this specific study, we notice that their sample size is a little over 500 people. Out of those 500 plus people, about that there were four of them that contracted non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. When it comes to, to statistics, this is a very small occurrence. It, it, it really doesn't quite relate. You know, when you watch some of those news programs and like, oh, we surveyed nine people and they all said this. Well, that's not really a good snapshot of the American public. So the big question that arises out of such a small sample size is, is it related to glyphosate? Or would it have developed in these people anyway? We, we don't know. So there have been many more surveys and studies done that have followed up with greater sample sizes, these epidemiological studies of 50,000 or greater that show no relation. So again, that's what the science says on this product. You know, we've been using it for many decades. We've had lots of safe studies in terms of safety. Uh, we use it quite a bit. And in terms of the science, it does not point to glyphosate as uh, creating higher instances of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, if used according to label directions. Now, we do see a negative impact on the environment when it comes to glyphosate. And this is also when misapplied, when people don't follow the label directions. It can have really bad effects on the environment. For instance, frogs, amphibians, are quite susceptible to glyphosate poisoning when it's applied to surface waters. Now, when you ask scientists, they believe that this is due more to the soaps and oils that are added to this product that allows it to stick to plant leaves, that allows it to stick to plant leaves, be taken up by those plants and do its job of killing that plant. Because, you know, soaps, oils, how do amphibians breathe? Through their skin, they get covered in these products, they can't breathe. The other thing is that there are inactive ingredients in these products. And the companies are not required to list those inactive ingredients. The only thing they're required to list are the active ingredients, the thing that does the killing, that mode of action ingredient. It, and really, whatever you use, follow the label. You're going to hear that a lot during this presentation. Choose the least toxic option. Keep in mind that the flamethrower, the vinegar, and the Roundup are all going to kill frogs. So again, evaluate these based upon risk and how they are going to impact the environment. So glyphosate, it's widely used, uh, probably the most popular uh, product on the environment. It's very effective. You know, it does a good job at killing plants, has a very low toxicity to humans, and also it doesn't stick around for very long. It binds to the soil particles and it breaks down quickly. It doesn't move around in the environment. So when you look at glyphosate and compare that to a lot of the other herbicides, this is probably the lowest risk one that we have access to. Some drawbacks though, there is a huge negative perception from the public and it can have harmful effects on the environment and us if we misuse it or use it thoughtlessly. Now let's look at another family of synthetic herbicides, and these are broadleaf herbicides. So these specifically target broadleaf plants. So not grassy plants, broadleaf plants. Think trees, dandelions, those are our broadleaf plants. Now these have a distinctive smell, and I'm sure if you've you've been outside, you know when these have been sprayed. They're, tip, they're very often used on uh, lawns as a broadleaf herbicide to kill all of the clover and things like that in your lawn, but leave the grasses there. These have also been making headlines lately, which we'll talk about. The What these are typically comprised of, they're called synthetic auxins or plant hormones, plant growth regulators. So what happens is these are hormones that we expose to the plants in such a high dose, the plant doesn't know how to grow and it dies. Grasses are also susceptible to being killed by these, but they have a higher tolerance for them 
So that is why we can spray them on our lawns without killing our lawn, but we can kill the dandelions. And as you can see in terms of EIQ 24D, um, it ranges based upon the company putting out that product 15 to 20. Uh, Meclaprop 21, Dicamba 28, Triclopyr 11. So in terms of relative risk, you can see those EIQ numbers, how they stack up against each other. Let's look at 2,4-D specifically. Studies have shown that many of these to be cancer-causing and dangerous. Now again, we have to look at when these studies took place. A lot of them happened many decades ago when dioxin was used as an inactive ingredient. Dioxin, we know now, is a very potent carcinogen. And it was also a major factor in those exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam and the effects that they are feeling today. More recent studies show these products to be now much lower risk. However, there are some studies because a lot of times folks will also ask, well, I just sprayed my lawn. What about my dog? And one of the studies that I did run across uh, out of Purdue does show that 2,4-D leads to higher cases of bladder cancer in dogs because dogs process 2,4-D through their bladder, but it gets hung up in there. The bladder can't process it, and it gets stuck in there, and it does lead to higher cases of bladder cancer. So in terms of risk, where would, where would that stack for you? Maybe you, if you have dogs, you aren't going to be using that, or you're going to make sure that you're going to be letting your dog out um, for maybe a week on a different part of the lawn that you've sprayed. But in terms of these, uh, these herbicides, these, these broadleaf herbicides, they're very good for killing invasive plants uh, around lawns or, or ornamentals, or if you, like myself, you're working on, say, a natural area restoration, a prairie or a woodland, they're really good for killing that bush honeysuckle. You know, so the, that, that's really my use for it. Some of the drawbacks, though, is that they are overused. There are are companies out there that will spray this stuff on your yard four times a season and that's crazy that's using it way too much there has been misuse that has been uh, documented that has been implicated in human health issues we get lots of phone calls about when we spray the stuff on our lawns and then it drifts or volatilizes from the lawn over to say our tomato patch and curls our tomato leaves and kills our tomatoes. And I just want to add this. Are killing dandelions worth it? Because dandelions are an awfully pretty flower. My kids love them. So, but that is your decision. That is up to the individual homeowner. If you want to have an immaculate lawn with a, without a weed in sight, you're probably going to have to turn to a product like this. Now let's look at some of the pre-emergent herbicides. Now the nice thing about these is um, it, it, it doesn't really affect humans as much. So a fairly low EIQs for most of them. However, the EIQ that you're seeing here might be a little bit higher because they have a long residual. They persist in the environment, which allows them to maybe affect non-target organisms. Um, and they're very broad spectrum. Any weed seed, whether you want it or not, can be killed by these pre-emergent herbicides. The low solubility is very nice. It doesn't dissolve in water, which makes it uh, very difficult for it to cross our human skin barrier. And we have also seen studies, though, where these products, like uh, trifluralin, is an active ingredient in a very popular pre-emergent, does sh has shown through studies to stunt the root systems of established plants. So again, just something to keep in mind. So relatively low risk, works really good at controlling seedlings, but it can damage crops you've ever already seeded and can stunt the growth of established plants. That's herbicides. Now, I know there's no way that we can possibly cover every single pesticide out there. So this is really just a snapshot of each family of pesticides. Now, herbicides, their main target are plants. Fortunately, we're not plants. Um, or not as related to plants. However, this next family, insecticides, we obviously aren't insects, but we do carry some of the same shared traits as insects. And so in terms of level of risk in insecticides, they're greater for us. So let's look at these specifically. Now, if we look at, again, we're going to look at some of these organic options. 
You know, we look at poison traps. Uh, you know, so we can have these ant traps. The the active ingredient is borax, or we can lure insects with food scents, like our Japanese beetle traps. We can even use uh, 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 mating pheromones to attract insects, like our peach tree borer, Japanese beetles, coddling moth, many others. Um, we can go pretty simple with our sticky cards and place those around our gardens or if we have a greenhouse in our greenhouse. Then we also have our visual traps that we use just to get us a count of the pests out there and they do account for a little bit for control but but not too much. And the picture there is the apple maggot trap. It's a red it's a red sphere with glue on it that attracts them in. You get a good count and gives you a little bit of control. And then also the Japanese beetle trap, which we know not to use, right? Yes. So in terms of traps and barriers, this is a very nice and passive way to control pests. It's safer than spraying something out onto the yard or garden. And it's also a good way for us to monitor pest levels to know maybe when a pesticide would be warranted. Uh, so, and a lot of these are useful for our smaller landscapes and some of our greenhouse settings. However, you're not going to catch all the pests in these. In fact, in the case of Japanese beetle traps, you might get many more to move to your yard than will ever fall into that trap. You're not going to be able to manage large populations of pests. And most are very specific to a certain pest. you got to manage and monitor them. They can become messy and smelly. And this is a little bit nitpicky, but technically these lures are as synthetic. So if you are a, a hardcore organic only naturals only person the lures are synthetic they are made in a lab and I don't know if that would fit your lifestyle if we look at some other organic products though this is Bacillus papillae or milky disease uh, so milky disease it is a soil dwelling bacteria it has been used as a pesticide for generations uh, it primarily targets Japanese beetle grubs, is what's pictured here in uh, the screen. Nice that it's low risk to us humans, targets a specific pest, it's not broad spectrum, it doesn't kill everything in the soil, and it won't affect the soil biology as much be like some of the other typical grub control products. However, some drawbacks are that it does take time for this disease to build up in the soil that will then infect our grubs, also, improper application in terms of when timing when you apply it can um, uh, basic, basically negate any control effects. So if you apply it to cold soil, well, these are living things. They need warm living soil to, to propagate. It's not going to be very effective. And also, over the years, our studies are showing a diminishing, diminishing effect of milky disease on Japanese beetles. So is it because the Japanese beetles are becoming resistant, or are we not making the product correctly. The other thing is it works as a Japanese beetle control over large areas. We're talking neighborhoods and communities. You're not going to control the Japanese beetles if in your yard if you're just treating your yard because these adult beetles can fly an awfully great distance. That's when we come to another organic insecticide. This is Bacillus thuringiensis, better known as Bt. You've probably heard of BT corn, that where we have so loved the positive effectiveness of this insecticide that we have extracted the DNA or the BT's genes and inserted it into various agricultural agronomic crops. This is again a soil dwelling bacteria and it acts as a stomach poison. So whatever you're poisoning, uh, needs to be fed upon, and it is a specific organism that is targeted by this. So uh, there are different strains of Bt. So Bt kerstaki only targets caterpillars. So tar a caterpillar takes a bite of the leaf, gums up its digestive system, kills a caterpillar. Bt israeliensis targets the larval stage of black fly. This is mosquitoes, and it kills the larval stage of mosquitoes where they're breeding in the water. And then there's also BT tenebriensis, or San Diego. This targets beetles. So some of the effects with BT, it's very safe and effective, that EIQ of 7.9, that's fantastic. And it's also not going to decimate our beneficial insects when we apply this. It will quickly stop feeding. And probably when it comes to controlling things like caterpillars, mosquito larvae, that's probably one of our best organic options that we have in our tool belt. 
Some of the drawbacks, though, is it has to be eaten by the target pest uh, to be effective. So that means you have to have good coverage of your plant. There's also very low residual, doesn't hang around very long. And, you know, if you want to target the actual thing that spreads disease from mosquitoes, the adults, you know, it doesn't really do anything for that. And they are often seen as the bigger problem. Um, but we can still use it to help control some of those larval stage mosquitoes. Another organic product is capsaicin, or hot peppers. Now, this is typically used as a repellent. It doesn't really kill insects. However, you know, it, a benefit would be if you eat a lot of hot peppers, hot sauce, buffalo wings, you aren't really exposing yourself to anything new. It works to repel uh, soft body insects or mammals, things like that, uh, for long periods of time, and it doesn't really affect beneficial insects. Some drawbacks are it can repel humans. Remember that talk about vinegar and how it kills plants and highly caustic? Well, if you've ever gotten hot pepper uh, in your eye, you know that's not fun. It's not comfortable. So you have to use proper PPE when you're applying this. And it's not 100% effective. And there is a growing body of evidence showing that capsaicin is carcinogenic. And even though I've seen this on the news, it doesn't really seem to have hurt our love for hot wings at all. So just something to keep in mind. We have a lot of other organic insecticides out there. Neem is a very popular one. I see that uh, being recommended quite a bit. It's processed from the neem tree native to India. Um, there's a couple different types of neem out there. We have clarified neem oil, which operates more as a horticultural oil. And then we have azadiractin, which is a pesticide that is distilled from that neem oil. Um, again, a low EIQ, 12.8. There have been Neem has been in the news, though, uh, in the past, and actually also very recently. Uh, improperly processed neem can contain aflatoxin, a very potent carcinogen. And um, it, so just something to keep in mind. Another organic insecticide, I, I, don't, I wouldn't actually give it that title, um, but it, it's often marketed as such, uh, and not really marketed in a store but online, is nicotine. Nicotine is a very potent nerve toxin, one of the most potent on the planet. It does a very good job at killing pests and people. It's very dangerous. And you can go online, you can look up uh, recipes for nicotine insecticide sprays, and you'll find those online. These are very dangerous. There is no, no EIQ number for nicotine because this should not be used as a pesticide. It has no place in either the organic or conventional landscape. So don't use this. Other organic insecticides that we have are oils. It's an older method, but still very useful. Look at the EIQ, though, 27.5. That's fairly high. Why is that? Well, that's because kind of like uh, when we're talking about Roundup and the amphibians, oils are used to coat organisms. And if you're like plants, which breathe through the leaves, amphibians, which breathe through the skin, or insects, which breathe through their bodies, that even if you coat a beneficial insect or a toad, or if you over apply on a plant, you can kill that organism. So it can be hazardous to anything that gets coated and plants can be negatively affected. That's why we say follow the label. Pyrethrums is another one. It's an organic insecticide distilled from chrysanthemum. It's popular in wasp sprays. Um, it's often combined with a couple other uh, products uh, that uh, that, that we that we use to make it more effective. It is toxic to beneficial insects. We are seeing resistance developing, um, but a fairly low-ish EIQ number is pyrethrum at, at, at 18. Again, more, rotenone. This is probably the most dangerous organic pesticide available. It's actually no longer accepted as a certified organic pesticide, but its chemistry is organic, and so that is how it is marketed. But you will not see it labeled as USDA certified organic. Very potent poison for insects and aquatics, aquatic life. And in lab studies, it's found to cause Parkinson's-like testing. The EIQ for this is 29, which to me seems very misleading when we take into account all the risks associated for this product. I would say the EIQ for this should be higher. Then we have Ryania. It's another organic-derived pesticide. Not much testing. Uh, on this one, actually, the major manufacturer has removed it from the market, 
The EIQ for this is 37, almost 40. Um, there are better products available with lower risk that have better testing behind them. And still more, Spinosad, soaps, uh, kaolin clay spray. And then if you look at something like garlic, again, garlic is actually not a registered pesticide. So there is no EIQ for this. Let's look at some of the synthetic insecticides now. We're going to look first at carbamates. Uh, you probably know the most popular one of this is uh, the active ingredient carbaryl, which is uh, in seven. Now these are nerve poisons to insects, which means they can be toxic to us humans as well. EIQ for seven is 21.7. Uh, it's effective against a lot of different types of insects. Uh, it affects beneficial insects as well as the pest insects. And then also listed are some of the other insecticides in the, the carbamate family. Now, Propox, Propoxpur, this is an example of something that was highly, highly toxic to us humans. The old EIQ was 87.3. But after the product has uh, gone under revision, it's a lower EIQ of 35. Probably still pretty high for my taste, though. We have some of our chlorinated hydrocarbons. Now, this is the thing that Rachel Carson wrote her book, Silent Spring, on. It just started the whole debate on pesticide safety. Best known compound is DDT. Uh, it has been banned in the US, along with many other countries. We do have one that is still very widely available that you'll find on the garden center shelf, uh, methoxychlor. Now, this EIQ is 53. Now, the reason why these are so uh, such a high EIQ is because they are not very toxic to humans, but they're very stable chemicals. It means they persist in the environment for many years, and that's bad. We don't like when chemicals, uh, when these types of chemicals stick around. And now, after decades and decades, it was overused to the point that many pests have now developed resistance to them. So you're probably going to start seeing these getting taken off the market. Uh, fairly soon. A newer family of insecticides known as neonicotinoids or neonics um, have emerged and probably the most popular home garden center one is imatocloprid. Now this is what we use to protect our ash trees from EAB. The toxicity for this for us humans fairly low considered relatively safe. However the EIQ was, is 36. This has actually gone up from uh, in the past, and this is more than likely due to more and more research showing an impact on pollinators. So the EIQ of this product has gone up. It is effective on a wide range of pests. It is systemic, so that's why we use it to control wood boring insects like EAB. And it has a long residual activity, which would you consider that good or bad? You know, if we're trying to protect our ash trees, we want that product to hang around for a long time. But if you are, you know, just an insect flying around, you probably don't want this hanging out in the environment for too long. And it really depends on the plant species. We don't have the research money to figure out what each species does with this product. But there are species like the linden tree that moves this into its pollen, which then negatively impacts pollinators. Again, probably why that EIQ has gone up and may go up even further in the future. And then we have the insecticide family organophosphates. Now this came from the Nazis, so you know it's probably not good. They made it to kill humans and also inadvertently also discovered it does a good job at killing insects. Now just a little star asterisk right here. Yes, Nazis researched this, but other countries were also researching organophosphates at the time. Um, but the, they, they found out though in their their research and use is that they were really good at killing insects rather than humans. It disrupts the nervous system. So guess what? Insects have them and so do we. So this is very toxic to us. It has a fairly long residual, which is again, in terms of from an environmental standpoint, not good. It's very good at killing things as we've already established, but pests are starting to develop resistance to them. And we will likely see these products phased out due to resistance and the toxicity. Malthion is probably the more popular one that we see in the garden center with an EIQ of 23. That's not too bad, but you can get some pretty bad ones uh, like disulfo disulfoton, uh, EIQ of 101. That, that would be something I wouldn't want to get next to or, or near. And then pyrethroids. Now these 
are actually the same as pyrethrins. Remember the ones distilled from the chrysanthemums? But these have just been uh, engineered to break down slower so you have better residual control. Um, nice thing is humans have an enzyme to break down some pyrethroids before they cause any damage to our bodies. Um, permethrin is the most common. Its EIQ is almost 30. It's that high because it's harmful to beneficial insects and aquatic life. Um, but we get a little bit more of that, that longer residual control, which is why it might be a more desirable product. And you've seen these on the garden center shelf. You can see uh, uh, the blue uh, diagram box here, uh, bifenthrin, cypermethrin, you know, anything with the thrin, you know, we're looking at a type of pyrethroid. Diseases. So now in terms of uh, disease control, uh, we're going to look at uh, both organic and syn synthetic products here too. But the first one I want to talk about is compost tea. Now this is one that I've been seeing more and more people talking about online, using compost tea to control diseases on their plants. There has been research out that shows that this has been effective. So let's talk a little bit about compost tea. Um, what's done is we, we take compost, or you can use compost to manure, put it in a bucket of water, toss in some sugar, molasses, uh, and you do this to let bacteria grow. And sometimes you'll put an aerator in it to even increase this bacteria. And the idea here is you're letting the, uh, that you're letting the good bacteria, maybe fungi, also grow in this, quote, tea that can be sprayed on plants to offer competition for the bad guys. So does it work? Yes, a few studies have showed positive results. However, a lot of studies have shown no benefit. Uh, even despite this, this is still being touted quite a bit online. It's also a huge food safety concern. So if you think about if we are going to be using composted manure, we compost manure because it helps to reduce the pathogens in manure that are human pathogens to a level that will not affect us, our health. When we take this and we we then encourage the growth of bacteria, not only do we encourage the beneficials, but we're probably going to encourage the not so beneficial bacterial growth. Um, so, you know, compost tea, it's going to take a lot of that sanitation measures that, that a lot of growers have done, um, you know, to keep their produce clean so that people don't get sick when they eat it. It takes that, it pretty much throws it out the window because applying compost tea to, say, salad greens is pretty much like throwing fresh manure on them. Another disease-fighting uh, uh, organic compound, you know, something that's touted as organic, is Bordeaux mix. And this is a combination of lime, water, and copper sulfate. Now, the interesting thing about this, the EIQ, when combined, is 67.7. That's because uh, it can be quite toxic to humans and aquatic life. So this is not really something you want to spray every day. It has been used for more than a century, so we do have documented efforts that it does work. Uh, it's effective against fungi and bacteria. Um, however, it can burn plants if you misapply it uh, or if the conditions are right. Uh, also, over time, copper can build up in the soil, which can be toxic to plants. Something to keep in mind with a lot of these fungicides also is that this is a protective. It's not something to cure the disease. It's not It's not a curative. So yeah, Bordeaux mix, a fairly high EIQ. Now, copper sulfate is the main contributor to that. As you can see, uh, in terms of just copper-based fungicides, copper sulfate has an EIQ of 61.9. Again, this is a fairly commonly used product by organic growers. Now, this there has been debate um, with the USDA uh, certified organic groups that maybe this should be pulled from that because of such uh, a negative effect to uh, humans and the environment. But once again, copper-based fungicides, these, uh, these have, uh, are protectants, not curatives. And really, it can be just as effective as synthetic controls. And we also have another product called lime sulfur. Now, lime sulfur, I, I remember this being more popular or more common in stores, but uh, I can't really find it anymore, but it's fairly easy to find online still. The thing is, it 
can be very phytotoxic to plants and some of the other products out there. So you've got to be very careful. Again, read those labels. It's still effective for controlling lots of diseases, and an extension does recommend lime sulfur for stuff like apple scab. Um, so in, in this case, uh, you know, uh, there's lime sulfur, but if you look at just sulfur, it might be a better option since it's less likely to damage plants. Um, but having the including lime or lime sulfur in here is a little bit more effective and once again it's a protectant not a curative We've got to always keep that in mind when we're we're looking at these fungicides now sulfur is the oldest pesticide that we still use it was used by ancient greeks to control rust on wheat it's once again a protectant now its eiq is 32. It's still fairly high it has to be reapplied frequently and it does have the potential to hurt or burn our plants and if we reuse this, it could lead to soil acidification, but we really shouldn't be that concerned with that in home landscapes because we shouldn't be using it that much, as, as much as it would require to acidify the soil. Then there's other products out there like potassium bicarbonate or sodium bicarbonate. Now, this is a relative to baking soda. Um, so potassium bicarbonate, fairly low EIQ. Um, in terms of literature, it offers satisfactory control, not the best. Uh, so for instance, if you wanna control the black spot in your rows, it's not necessarily gonna work for that. But it is relatively low risk for us humans, so it makes it a good choice for a lot of home gardeners. And then we get into antibiotics, uh, things that we use to control bacterial infections out of our plants, such as oxytetracycline. Um, typically, so does Mycoshield has an EIQ of 21. Um, you know, it is very effective against things like bacterial spot, maybe fire blight, but like all antibiotics, even the stuff that we use for us humans, resistance is a huge concern and it can't treat fungal diseases, which is usually makes up the bulk of plant pathogens. And this is actually not labeled for USDA certified organic production, but it is an option out there. Now, a quick look at some of the synthetics, uh, uh, disease-fighting pesticides. So if we look at plant activators, this is something that stimulates the plant to produce uh, disease-fighting compounds. So it kind of tricks the plant into thinking it's being attacked. Um, there's, there's a lot of different types. Uh, some of them aren't really found to be very effective. There, um, you know, there, there are a couple out there that do show some good results. Um, and like right here, uh, I apologize, I'm gonna butcher the name, Acbenzolar S-methyl, um, EIQ of 20. This is a chemical analog to aspirin. So it's shown to be fairly effective, but it's a sort of a newcomer on the scene. We need to do more research for this. We also have protectant fungicides. Um, so the, these uh, synthetics here, uh, they're kind of the first ones that were developed. We still use a lot of them today. Um, we spray them on the plants. It lands on the surface of the plant. It provides a protective layer to the plant from fungal spores that might land on there and try to germin or prop propagate. It doesn't give the best disease protection because it has to have good coverage on the top of the leaf, on the bottom of the leaf, or on the trunk, on stems, things like that. More research is coming out and some of the negative effects of fungicides on things like our pollinators and other insects. So um, these EIQs might shift again in the future, uh, but very popular ones like chlorothalonil, chlorothalonil Captain, Mancozeb, uh, Thyram, uh, just so those products out there. Contrast those to a systemic fungicide. These have been found to be amazingly effective. Uh, really good control because you, uh, the plant takes up the product it, it, it within its vascular system and it protects it from disease-causing organisms. However, it's a double-edged sword because they soon found that these pests developed a very quick resistance to these products because it's always in the plant. You know, this plant's constantly getting bombarded with fungal spores, leads to greater opportunity for de resistance to develop. So. Basically for this, uh, you know, you have to be careful because you're gonna be treating for one disease, but maybe you're going to allow for resistance of a different disease to develop. 
you know, so you're trying to keep Black Spot from killing your Rose, and suddenly Anthracto shows up, has become resistant, and kills the whole thing. It moves through the plant's vascular system, which is good because that's 100% protection. It does help to keep plants pristine until resistance develops. There has been studies to show that there's a negative effect on beneficial fungi like mycorrhizae. Um, it does offer longer protection. However, again, that resistance is such a huge issue, so you really do have to rotate your chemicals. And if you're, if, if you are contemplating systemic fungicides, it really should be like a high value plant that you're going to be applying these to. Okay, it's been about an hour and I wanna give you my bottom line uh, when it comes to the safety of organics versus synthetics. So are organics safer? Well, organic practices are. If we go back to history and we look at what it really is, it's about soil management. It's about good plant culture. It's about the right plant in the right place. Um, making sure that we're keeping our beneficial insects in mind with habitat, integrated pest management, and managing our water resources. So yeah, that that's, that's safe. That's good to do. That's good. So those core organic principles, you know, really the foundation of organic gardening, yes. Um, I would consider those to be very safe. It's when we throw pesticides into it, it changes. It really needs to be on a case-by-case -case basis. You cannot lump in all of the organic pesticides and then all of the synthetic pesticides into two groups and say, this one's safe and this one's not. That's a mistake. Because the biggest problem is that, you know, if we call ourselves organic gardeners or homeowners, we may not be aware of the risk when it comes to some of these organic pesticides because a lot of it is marketed as natural and you know natural things can't hurt us right well you know i've been stung by a bee before i've gotten poison ivy before those are natural things so nature definitely can and i think wants to hurt us the other factor that's um uh, we can get into is that synthetic compounds tend to go under much more stringent testing before they're released onto the market. Some of those same requirements are not in place for, quote, natural compounds. So, for example, synthetics, they undergo stringent testing for residual, how long they persist in the environment. Natural compounds don't have to go through uh, this stringent residual testing. They're exempt. So in 1996, the US EPA said on natural chemical compounds to the greatest extent possible that only the minimum data sufficient to make scientifically sound regulatory decisions will be required. I don't like that word minimum. It just kind of bugs me a little bit. So this quote comes from Jeff Gillum uh, in his, his book, The Truth About Organic Gardening. Uh, he says, are we trying to protect people and our environment from dangerous pesticides in general or just those that we make ourselves. So Jeff, he is, uh, uh, he got his degree in horticulture, uh, master's in entomology from University of Georgia. He's associate professor at University of Minnesota. So he's just not some guy writing a book. So in conclusion, organic gardening should be about making safe choices based upon sound horticultural principles to protect us and the environment. We should reduce the amount of pesticides we use, no matter what what type we use or how we label ourselves, whether we're organic or conventional. And instead of thinking of them as synthetic or organic, think safe and effective. Or think low risk, moderate risk, high risk. You know, think of things in terms of risk and follow the label. That's the biggest piece of advice that we can offer you is to follow that label. So that's the book that I mentioned earlier. It's by Jeff Gillum. There's a lot of other good books out there um, that do cover this, uh, but I pulled a lot of information from Jeff's book on on this very, very topic. Um, that is my contact information. Uh, feel free. You're always welcome to give me a call, shoot me an email. There's my address, my office address. I guess if you want, you can show up uh, and, and we can chat. And again, you can view this and past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening webinar series on our YouTube channel. You would just go to University of Illinois Extension Horticulture, and that's where the videos are posted. And we do have a survey.
for you to take. So if you've listened to this, uh, we would love for you to take a brief survey. You can scan uh, the, your phone or tablet with this QR code or just go to this link below to take a very, very quick survey. It's very brief uh, just to get a glimpse of the things that we have offered. And I am happy to address questions at this point. And I know that there are some in the chat box, so let me catch up to those. Yeah, Chris, we do have a few questions. Uh, regarding compost teas, what if you use uh, compost or worm castings to make the tea? Do these still contribute to negative effects? Um, in terms of negative effects, uh, I'm looking at it from a standpoint of food safety. I would never spray something that I'm going to eat with a compost, like with a compost tea. Um, that is, is something that more research needs to be done, though, to determine the levels of bacteria, fungi, whatever human pathogen might cause us health issues in that product. I would avoid the use of spraying edible crops with compost tea from a food safety standpoint. Um, the other thing is in terms of the uh, efficiency of using compost tea, research does show that using just plain compost is about is the same as, as as using compost tea, and there's fewer steps to doing it. You can put worm castings. So I keep worms in my basement. I use those castings in my garden. I side dress my plants with the castings, and I let ma nature make the tea with with rain and, and so on. Um, yeah. The next next question is: Can you talk a bit about spinosad and the insecticidal soaps? Uh, let's see. In, in terms of covering uh, spinosad, uh, insecticidal soaps, um, uh, spinosad is, uh, it, it does come from, I believe, a soil dwelling organism, um, you know, similar to like BT products. And I, it, it is used in a lot of different organic products. Uh, I, I do find that there are certain things that it is, it, it works to control. Uh, However, I have also used it on pests that it is labeled for, and I have not gotten satisfactory control. Um, insecticidal soaps, uh, similar to the oils, you have to be very, very careful with this. You know, I had a, a caller to the office. They were having aphids on their, I think it was an azalea. No, 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 sorry. It was a hibiscus that they had out on their patio. They had aphids on it. And... Uh, the aphids were taking over, so they took a insecticidal soap and they sprayed the plant. And they went with the idea is, well, a little's good. I'm just going to empty the whole bottle of it on this plant. That'll really kill them. Uh, kind of did, but it also killed the plant too because it blocked that stomata on the leaves that that's the plant uses to, in essence, breathe. And the plant is also suffocated along with the aphids. But if they had just followed the label and read how much to apply, that wouldn't have happened. Um, so, so yeah, that that's about as much as I can comment on those products. Um, yes. Yeah, that that's really the most important part is always follow the label yeah. whenever it comes to chemicals and insecticides, herbicides. Our last question that was in the chat box: When you prepare. Dahlia tubers for overwinter storage, it is often suggested to brush the tubers with sulfur as a protection against rot. Is this a bad idea? Hmm. Janet, that's a good question, and I'm not really sure of the answer. Uh, that would be something I'd have to look more closely. Now, you could check with some extension resources. Um, if you go to uh, Mr. Google Pants, you could type that in. I always include in my searches, uh, I include the word extension. That will get you to an extension resource, a university resource. Um, and you can type in Dahlia tuber storage, then extension. That'll get you to uh, hopefully some type of information that is research-based. Again, that's why I can't answer your question, because I don't know the research on it. Um, the label may also specify proper protocol in terms of handling uh, storage items like this with uh, Dahlia. I would definitely be 
going over that label with uh, you know fine tooth comb. You can even look at uh, more detailed labels online. You can be calling the company, uh, asking for what they recommend. Uh, just because, especially if you're looking at something like a food storage product, like a sweet potato. If you're looking at like potatoes, onions, something that you're going to be trying to protect from rot, so you can get around to eating it, say in January. So I don't know the answer to that, Janet, but if you want to email me, I will be happy to do the research for you and get you an answer. All right, Chris, we've had another question. How do you dispose of empty bottles or containers of pesticides properly? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I, I noticed there are members of the our pesticide safety team online. They could probably help me out here. Um, if you do have... I will just say, if you have bottles of pesticide that are out of date, that have expired, that you still have product in there, you can track down a household hazardous waste disposal site. Illinois EPA does help to put that on. You can contact your local health department on where you might be able to find those nearby. Um, but you can also find sites online. I know we had one of those nearby where I am in Macomb, there was one in Havana about 45 minutes away. That's already done and gone. Um, but in terms of empty pesticide bottles and containers, uh, I would say I would do what Michelle Wiesbrock says, uh, who's on our pesticide safety team. She says you can triple, triple rinse the containers and dispose in a landfill. And there's been additional information put in the in the chat box. And don't forget to recycle. We have another question. I've been having trouble with squirrels digging at roots of my plants and using uh, ground hot peppers and hot pepper water. Am I hurting anything beneficial? As far as I know, you're probably not hurting anything beneficial other than the, uh, the risk to yourself. Uh, just making sure you're taking proper precautions when you're using these products. Um, the hot peppers tend to be more of a repellent. They don't tend to have any uh, uh, killing effect on other organisms. But you know, it, getting that in your eyes, as I've done, I've I have chopped up jalapenos and then not thinking, swiped at my eye. Um, that hurts. And it, it, it comes with its own risks, so please just just be cautious. And I, I think the main point of this, this talk today is just making sure to remind folks that uh, organic does not equal safe. Um, we have to make sure that we are treating all of these products, organic or synthetic, with respect. They are very useful tools, and I hope those squirrels are staying away from your plants now. Um, and I, I hope you're also being safe. <laughs> 